Hi everyone, today's Real Vision Daily Briefing is sponsored by CraneShares. Learn about their KCCA ETF at craneshares.com forward slash KCCA forward slash Real Vision. Now to the top analysis of today's markets. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. With me today is Vincent Tillowar, Director of Global Macro Strategy at StoneX. Hi, Vincent. How are you? Great. Happy to be here. Yeah, we've got, uh, I, I'm always happy you're here on Inflation Day to Day, since you are one of the, you know, longtime inflationistas. Proudly, you've been on that call and very right on it for a long time. So um, we had the September producer price index come in a little hotter than expected. Interestingly, we didn't see a lot of market reaction. Um, it seems maybe investors are you know, waiting for the next shoe to drop because we do have CPI out on Thursday. But what do you think? Is this the beginning of a second wave of inflation? Probably, um, I, I wouldn't, I don't call it the beginning of the second wave yet. I think what what's happening now is kind of a, a stabilization of inflation at an uncomfortably high level. Uh, I think for what it's worth, I think that's what we're going to see tomorrow. Um, and, and I think we're kind of going to bounce around that level uh, for a while. And then, yeah, maybe there will be, um, my, my, my best guess is that there will be a second wave of inflation because that is the historical pattern. If you look at it, the long-term history of inflation, it always comes in waves after two or three years. But the, the driver of that second wave, um, usually some sort of geopolitical event, that is, is hard to predict. Uh, we, may, we may be seeing it now. It may be an escalation with Iran. It may be a second oil shock. Uh, we'll see. But even without that, uh, my base case is that inflation doesn't come back uh, to 2%. Um, and, and that is not that big a problem for the Fed at the end of the day. Like I think the Fed will happily take uh, a stabilization of inflation at this current level. Yeah, rather than going back up. I, I'm going to continue the the inflation conversation in a minute, but somebody tells me we have a, a surprise guest. Is that right? <laughs> Raul. <laughs> I keep joking that Milton's everywhere. I kind of feel like you might be everywhere. Uh, it's, it's great to see you. I was going to say you are, and we were th we were thinking you might join us at the top of the show. So thank you, Vincent, for hanging tight for a second. But we wanted to try to catch up with you because we are just about to kick off a festival of learning, the next digital asset wave, which we're super excited about. Um, and and you're in New York for a lot of exciting things. So give us a little preview. What, what's going to be happening over the next couple of days? Look, festival of learning is something we've been doing at Real Vision for a while. I think we started in the pandemic. And the idea is to give people a concentrated learning in a particular topic. And this time, it's all about crypto and digital assets and the way forward. And we partnered this time with Ledger, who are you know good friends of ours at Real Vision. Everybody knows people like Ian Rogers, um, who've been on at Real Vision quite, quite often. And the idea is to partner with them to help as many people as possible as we're in this crypto spring period how to think about the couple of years ahead, how to position yourself, how not to screw up like people have done in the past, how to understand what to do about security, how to understand how things like NFTs work and how you should approach them, how you should think about trading, uh, trading these markets and also learn from some of the mistakes of others. That's always a key thing that we do with these festival of learnings is how not to screw things up and how I screwed something up in the past. So yeah, um, and you're using your, your best, very best language with that. <laughs> sometimes we sometimes we refer to it a bit more strongly, but you're yeah. right. But, you know, I, I think you're making an accept uh, a, a sort of assumption that everybody knows who folks like Ian Rogers is. I mean, his life story he, and he's going to uh, be going to be on one of the panels. His life story is nothing short of remarkable. I mean, this guy has been on the forward foot of every major innovative wave that's come to us. He's one of those people that I think sees around corners, which is why I think this will be so cool for people. Yeah, I mean, Ian, not only was he on tour with the Beastie Boys, not only is he's a skater from Indiana, but also he was the very forefront of 
the music, the digital music revolution yeah. with, he was one of the co-founders of Winamp. And he's a chief experience officer himself. So he designs the experiences. He's a, he's a coder as well. He does everything. But he did that. They then sold it. They then built Yahoo Music. They then yeah. sold that. They then, um, then he joined up with Dr. Dre and built Beats by Dre, which then got bought by Apple Music. He then built Apple Music. He then decides to leave. He goes to some small startup called Louis Vuitton Moet <laughs> Hennessy, which is the largest luxury goods company in the world. He joins the board there with the remit um, of getting them into the digital world. They were 1% digital sales, mm -hmm. and he got them into over 50% of all of their sales worldwide were digital. And that was helping Bernard Arnault personally, who's the second richest man in the world, do that. He then leaves that and says, fuck it, I'm going to crypto yeah. and Web3 because they need my help. And it's another revolution like the internet music revolution, like the online revolution. And he came and joined that. So I think yeah. it's just yeah. one of, I mean, he's a good friend of mine, but he's just one of the people at the event. We've got Keith Grossman, who was the president of Time magazine, who took a sleepy newspaper uh, magazine, brought them into Web3 at the forefront of Web3. And he's now at MoonPay. We've got some of the best <sighs> NFT artists in the entire space. Um, we've got regulators talking through regulation. We've got some of the very best people in regulation, including, you know, people from government, outside government, um, and at the forefront of all of this. So, yeah, well, I think this is important because there could be some people who are thinking like, okay, crypto, I know you're calling it crypto spring because you're so in it, but crypto is kind of dead right now. Why should I pay attention? You know, I'll catch up whenever it kind of springs back to life. But these are all people who are always many steps ahead of others. So I think it's sort of important to pay attention to what's and, going on right now. And, and what is important is, look, this is a new asset class, relatively new. It's really been going 10 years, a little bit over 10 years. Most people in the space are very new. Most people are in the space from the last cycle or the cycle before. Many people didn't come like me with a, with a traditional finance background and haven't learned all of the tools yet. So everyone's yeah. trying to learn on the fly. And so the idea here is we're here to help. We're here to give people, you know, if Real Vision is all about the kind of giving people the knowledge, the tools and the network to thrive and survive, well, here we are. This is going to give you all of the knowledge well, it's on the platform and the new real <laughs> platform, you're going to get all of the tools that you need. And the network, well, we're all there chatting, talking to each other, learning from each other. So it yeah. should give you whatever you need to get ready for the years ahead. Yeah, I'm, su I'm super excited about it. Ian Rogers also, by the way, had a kid when he was 17. I mean, this is like great. His story is just absolutely remarkable. I'm super excited. And you and I are going to finish it out with an AMA, I think, on Friday, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right. And I'm going to actually take a poll during the show today um, and, and ask them what they think we should be drinking. Because we know you're partial to Spanish cava. You're going to have just come back from New York. So you're going to be I introduced back. you to Spanish cava and you <laughs> saw the lights, right? You're like, oh, my God, this, this is, is amazing. This is true. This is true. But I'm going to leave it Vincent, up to you. Cover your ears. I know it's not French, but it's, you know. Uh, yes, that's right. Well, Vincent will forgive us. I, I, um, I am going to give leave it up to our audience, though, Raul, to say what they think we should be celebrating the end of the Festival of Learning for. So stay tuned. Don't go easy on him, everybody. Let's pick something good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for letting me gate crash here. But. Everybody, listen, it's a really good opportunity. We're passionate about learning, passionate about teaching people. So take this opportunity. It's completely free. I mean, that's the, the best thing about it. It's completely free. You'll get an opportunity. And there's a whole bunch of other great stuff. We've built a gamified uh, experience with Ledger around learning called a Ledger Quest. There's kind of giveaways of NFTs. There's also giveaways of uh, Real Vision Ledger devices. That's for storage, your safe storage. Um, of your assets. There's a lot of fun stuff going on over that yeah. period, but most of all, you're going to get a lot out of it and it doesn't cost you a penny. So it, it's the best zero dollars you'll ever spend in your life. <laughs> and we've got a, we've got a macro crypto panel too. Um, I understand too. So that's going to be fun to talk about the crossover. All right. I'm super psyched. What are you in, what are you in New York for? Can we ask, are you, are you at Liberty to say? 
Well, yesterday I was seeing um, a whole mix of stuff. I was on Jordi Visser's podcast talking about AI this morning. Oh, went into his office. That was a mind blowing conversation. I saw Coinbase Asset Management yesterday, checking what they're up to. Uh, I'm going to Carly Riley, um, who's um, overpriced JPEGs. I've got a live event with her tonight. Sergio Silva's coming. Oh, uh, fine. Another favorite on Real Vision. Um, another crypto person. And catching up with just a whole bunch of people about different stuff. So a bit Great. of a disjointed running around trip. And I even well, that's good. That's what in, intelligence going. gathering. Um, so you yeah. can bring it all back into the festival. We love it. Well, you've escaped me this time. We're not going to meet up in, in the studio for a live one. We'll, we'll do it soon next time. Yeah. Next time you'll be begging to come to Cayman to do it. Because next time <laughs> we do that, it'll be winter. And you'll be like, please get me out of New York. <laughs> all right. I might, I might hold you to that. You're on, you're on the record for that. All right, Raul. Have fun. Take care. We'll see you later. All right, everyone. Take care. See you at the Festival of Learning. Starts tomorrow and Friday. It'll all be recorded as well. So you can catch up with all the sessions you didn't get. Real get Vision. As as right. But you want to join live so you can ask your questions. Realvision.com forward slash Festival 23. All right, Raul. Safe travels. Take care. Bye-bye. He's going to be up very late tonight, New York. All right, Vincent, come on in. He had to torch you. He should have known you were in the show and said something nice about French wine, but that's Raul for you. It's a pleasure to see Raul. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to our let's get back to our macro conversation. Um, so the Fed would take a slowdown, except a slowdown in inflation. But is it going to be enough for bond investors? We've had this really this dynamic where everyone keeps sort of waiting for that moment that we're going to see the turn and they've been trying to time it all along. And it's been a really painful trade for a lot of people. Do you do you get the sense that people are finally embracing higher for longer or, you know, if we see inflation even just start to settle here, will that be enough for the bond market? How do you see the relationship? I think <clears throat> all over over the medium term, you know, of course, you know, the CPI comes, you know, softer, you'll see treasuries rally and, and vice versa. But over the medium term, what's really going on in the treasury market is more about supply and demand than it is about fundamentals, mm. uh, which is why uh, we introduced about eight months ago a uh, liquidity scorecard that basically tracks. I mean, you know, Stonex is a um, historically back 100 years, we trade, you know, pork bellies and, and coffee and uh, any sort of commodities. And, and, and whenever, you know, if you analyze the pork belly market, you know, you I guess you you look at the number of porks. I, I believe every pork has one belly, so that's simple. <laughs> uh, and, and then the, whoever eats pork bellies, like, I don't know, Chinese delis, I don't know. Anyway, um, but you try to develop a, a model for supply and demand. Um, and, and that's been my approach uh, for the treasury market. I mean, I have a, a global macro view, which, you know, real vision uh, viewers are familiar with, I'm kind of higher for longer, uh, great reset of race, inflation, second inflation, so forth. But for, at the end of the day, the, the bond market doesn't really care about my view of, of secular inflation or our star or the neutral rate. It doesn't care about my econometric model of the term premium. I mean, it cares about how many dollars are coming in and how many bonds are being sold. Um, and and that's that's been the reason why yields are being coming back up, especially since we had this uh, quarterly refunding announcement last quarter that just, you know, swamped the market with trillion insurance at a time when the usual buyers were just not there. Um, so, sure, the the CPI number is important. And I mean, even, even I, I could see a trade in, in, in bonds right now, of course, as I, I mean, the, the move is so big that you're like, hey, especially if you get the real yields, like, oh, it's, it's attractive, you know, like you get, you know, mm -hmm. 3.3% uh, two-year real yield. I mean, that's insane. Uh, almost 5% on the 10-year. Uh, so there's probably a trade there. Um, maybe finally. <laughs> uh, but I don't think that, you know, the, the kind of the recession trade, right? The, the idea that, um, you know, the, this is kind of like a wait, right? Where, you know, the Fed, the Fed had hiked to five five twenty five, and then you know, it's going to cut to zero and then the entire yield curve is going to collapse and you're going to make 30 40 percent with with your tlt um i think people are just going to keep pouring money into tlt uh and that will never happen wow so 
So that's wrong. That's wrong footed. Why? What t t you sent over, I think, a liquidity chart. Talk to me about the supply and demand and why you think that's not going to happen. So we have heard people say, listen, to a certain extent, some of what we're seeing in bonds is disconnected from the economic fundamentals. And it sounds like you're also saying that. And I'm assuming the supply is all this issuance that's coming onto the market. So why aren't we going to get that turn that everyone expects or why won't we see I, I, I understand you're saying that there's a tradable, a short-term tradable, maybe short right. move for bonds, but why won't we see that sort of more pronounced turn that tends to come with these cycles? What's going on that seems different to you? I mean, trillion dollar deficits is the, the quick answer, right? I mean, you have this flood of issuance that, and again, talking to that tactical turn, I can see it like the, the, the refunding. I think we, we, we had a, some sort of a trillion in a quarter. We're probably going to be Around closer to 800 billion, which is for the next, which is still huge, but marginally better. Uh, we refill the, uh, the Treasury General account is almost refilled, um, so we we have some reason to also we'll see um, uh, tax come in uh, first from California. California's uh, tax filing deadline was pushed out to October 15, so you'll see that money come in that will reduce the amount of borrowing that we need to do, and you get to year end, you get more more, more tax payments. So. That that's the trade idea, right? Yes, supply will get marginally better uh, in in the next two months because it was at such a horrible level before mm -hmm. that. I mean, it's not going to get any new, new bullish. It's going to be a little bit less bearish. Um, and then uh, looking at the the demand side, yeah, you, you'll probably some you know, uh, I mean, the, the the yields have moved up so much and so quickly that people will be. Um, in ties, I mean, even I, you know, my my call for a long time has been, hey, don't overthink it. Just buy two-year notes and and you know, sleep sleep at night. Um, you know, I'd, I'd be inclined to like push out the duration a little bit, obviously. Um, so that's the trade part. Over the longer term, though, um, both I would say from a supply and demand and a fundamental perspective, I think you end up with these kind of higher yields. I mean, it's going to be a process. You know, it never goes up in a straight line. It'll be moves and counter moves and, and things like that. But um, I think we need to see these higher term premiums. Uh, we, we've already moved quite a bit on the term premium. But um, if you can, if you believe like me that you know the 2010s are over and we're in a kind of a new secular inflationary era where stocks and bonds are positively rated, where inflation is more volatile, where growth is more volatile, where deficits are structurally higher, you need to see that term premium, not at zero the way it is, but actually maybe one, two, three percent, like mm. it used to be in the 80s and 90s. So if we're looking at a treasury, if we're looking at the treasury market, what does that look like? I mean, right now we had the market, you know, pricing in a lot of rate cuts, then they took right. some out. Right. Where are we with that? And if we're looking at this, just structurally higher rate environment. How high is that on on the sort of ten year, thirty year? Yeah, um, I think one one difficulty that people have is you know they, they they look at the yield curve and then from the yield curve you can extrapolate the path of, of future monetary policy, right? Because you know that from the one year and the two year yield you can extrapolate the one year in one year and, and so forth. You can you know compound the little, the little increment. And if you do that on the yield curve, even how flat it's become, you've seen that we've priced out a lot of cuts. Um, you know, we were, um, you know, we had um, more than four, and now it looks like, you know, the Fed is not going to cut below 4.3%. That's very low. I mean, even, even I, I believe, will we'll hit an economic slowdown. The economy will slow in 2024. Now, will it be enough to get us into a recession? I'm, I'm not confident yet to make that call, but it certainly is possible. If we do have a recession, I expect the Fed to cut at least to 3%, not, not 4 So you have this sense of like, okay, things are not right when you look at the yield curve. Um, you know, there should be more cuts in there. Uh, but then you look at the long end, and you know, it's big, at this point, the yield curve is pretty much flat, right? And you think also, well, but there's also a chance that inflation picks up, that we have a second wave of inflation, what we we're talking about earlier, that typically happens. That's not in the curve either. So you have to understand that this flattish yield curve is not a forecast that yields are not going to, the, the Fed is not going to move rates. It's the result of two opposing forces. Mm. One, yeah, surely if we have a recession, there will be cuts. But also, we know that at some point, yields will have, the, the Fed will have to hike again, inflation may come back. And I actually believe both these things to be true. 
Uh, mm. Now they may happen in 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 sequence. Uh, I, my best guess, unless we have a a really nasty geopolitical shock, which may be on the way, my best guess is that you know the the economy will slow first, and then we'll have a second facial shock. But um, the the point is that the yield curve cannot predict the two things at the same time, right? It has mm-hmm. it has to be the average of both, and I think that's what we're seeing right now. So, do you think that? the market is in any way prepared for, I mean, higher for longer. People just seem to think, oh, the Fed's not going to cut for longer, but your higher for longer means that we are just in a new regime yeah. with higher interest rates. Those yeah. don't seem like the same thing to me. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think the the way we get to my scenario is through the the Fed keeping rates higher for longer, which seems to be the inclination, I think, from from the minutes and um, from what I the communication that I see from the Fed, it seems that I think they're gonna basically skip that last hike that mm. you know was in the dots, but not really, uh, and then just just say okay, instead we're gonna keep it for longer, like basically you know they can play with the level or the duration and say okay, we're gonna do the duration, uh, why not? Um, and then I think. The more time passes, the more you realize that the conditions will never be ripe uh, for these massive easing cycles, and and that yeah, my, my, my scenario of rates resetting, um, and, and in that reset scenario, um, you know five percent is is very very reasonable for the ten year. I mean, you can go a lot. You know, if if you have, I don't know, let's let, let's call inflation on average three and a half four percent. Uh, real growth. I'm, I'm actually quite bullish on real growth. I mean, with the kind of deficits that we have, it's almost a given that we'll have higher growth. So, you know, that that leaves nominal GDP growing at six, seven percent uh, over the long term. So, you know, tenure at five percent is nothing uh, uh, surprising. Yeah, it sounds uh, like mean, you're anything, saying the range is higher. You're not yes. going to get that sort of deep right. cut. And then reacceleration, they're just going to sit there, but inflation comes back and then it goes higher. So it never goes as low as people are expecting. And it may overshoot on the higher end if that second wave of inflation does come up. Yeah. Which is not what the bond market seems to be pricing in if we have people who keep looking to get in and buy that turn, which is what we seem to have. Um, Let's grab a question here. So... Jeremy asking, can banks be profitable in this environment? I mean, generally, before SVB, <laughs> the consensus was that higher rates and steeper curves were good for banks uh, because um, you know banks typically have free money in the form of deposits and they, they compound it at a higher rate. And when 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 the curve steepens, um, typically, there's a duration mismatch when deposits have a zero duration and banks' assets have a longer duration. So, um, I, I do think yes, banks uh, can and should be profitable in the right environment. Uh, now, there will be uh, the need to reprice assets for this world, which has not been felt. Uh, so, the way banks um, banks carry securities, you know, basically uh, three uh, accounting categories: um, mark to market. Um, that's typically where they put their stocks. Up to that, that's that's what everyone has to do. And normal people, we have to mark stuff to market. Mm-hmm. Uh, available for sale. Uh, so I think it's, it's got to do with the, the, the profits versus the capital gains. Um, it's kind of internally for the category. But kind of the one that's important is a hold to maturity, where you just carry the thing at, at book value. Okay, well, it will it will mature at a thousand in, in ten years. So it's it's a thousand dollars right there. Uh, that's where you know most of the uh, the long term securities are, the long term treasuries are. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you you can scream at it. I think Bank of America has about a hundred billion dollar in 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 uh, underwater position if these mm. held to maturity treasuries were were written down, but they don't. And I mean, the bonds will mature at a thousand. <laughs> uh, so this is an interesting question, and it relates to a comment that was earlier in the chat, Ralph, saying. And I'm, I haven't seen this myself, so I'm going to take Ralph's word for it. Paul Tudor Jones recently commented that he was bullish on gold, the barbarous relic, Bitcoin, and yield curve steepening trades. Where is Vincent on that? But I just want to pause that for a second. So Leon earlier said very respectfully, which I appreciate, Leon, um, 
why do we have to talk about crypto? Can we just get to the macro stuff? This is why we talk about all of them, because this is what you're seeing. I mean, you know, you have everyone looking at all asset classes. So we try to be across all of them and make sure everyone is. That's why we don't want to sort of segment things, because then we're just living in an echo chamber where we're only talking about certain things, right? So we try to keep our mind openly on and make sure that all of us are where we need to be. So anyway, back to the question. Um, but thank you for the front. Thank you for the comment. We always look at feedback. So I don't know. How do you feel about that, uh, Vincent? Gold, oh. Bitcoin, and yield curve steepening trades. On, on crypto, I'm not going to comment. I think you have m much more competent guests than, than I am. Um, on the steepening, I mean, I've been the, a steepener guy for, <laughs> uh, you know, far too long, and it's been extremely painful. And, and finally, we are seeing this, this steepening. Um, I, I don't think it's over. Uh, now the question is, what what kind of a steepening uh, do we see? Uh, is it the 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 the, the, the bullish kind or the bearish kind? Right. The, the the bullish kind is the, the yield curve steepens because the Fed um, is forced to to cut rates. Um, kind of like the um, uh, 09 2010 steepening Fed funds rate falls to five, and then but the entire curve falls, but the firm falls more. Um, and then the, the bearish kind is where, what uh, we've had uh, since since um, really three months now, uh, where the long end kind of catches up uh, with the front end. Um, my, my guess is that we'll see both. Um, I think for now we still see this kind of bearish steepening on, not not immediately. Uh, like I said, there's a, the, we need to digest this move. It's possible that you know we see a, a retracement of we're already seeing it of long term yields, but. Eventually, under the impact of these deficits, under the fact that, I mean, I do think that the economy slows, but I think this slow down is going to be very slow, and there will be um, um, scary moments where, oh, uh, whether it's a CPI number that will come out or come too hot, or the the jobs number or the unemployment rate, especially labor market. I think the labor market does not cool as as, as quickly as people mm. think it will. Uh, so we could see more of these kind of bear steepening. Um, and and in a way, the bear steepening kind of feed on the bull steepening because the the, the more the, that that's an argument that I've seen a lot of uh, FOMC members make. It's like, well, we don't need to tight to tighten anymore because the long end is tightening for us. Uh, so the more the long end steepens, the less need you have for uh, further rate hikes. And you may even see, I don't know, maybe three six months on the road, the Fed made the argument that you know financial conditions have tightened enough that that they can actually start cutting rates. Maybe that's Maybe that is the, the trigger for the cycle of cuts is going to be um, uh, higher long term rates, tightening financial conditions in 2024. Yeah. Does that does that tightening of financial conditions and, and another potential spike in rates? What does that do to the equity market? How do you feel about yeah, that? That's a, yeah, that, that to me, that's the big thing. I mean, and, and actually high yield spreads as well. Right. I mean, you can. It's amazing. I mean, it's it's and I have to think that these things need to correct uh, your, 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 you know, the we went from a, on a, to me if i had to give one stat to you know someone who's fallen into a coma about two years ago uh one number i would give two year yield two year real yield so tips yield inflation adjusted went from minus three percent to 3.5 percent so you have a seven percent increase in the short-term risk-free rate mm. 700 basis that 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 is that is massive and at the same time stocks be has been more as stable at 20. one of these two things is wrong <laughs> I don't think the yields are wrong, right? I mean, the, my view is that the yields are resetting to its normal world. Stocks have not reset. Um, I mean, you need to see, and then, you know, it will happen that that equity risk premium needs to be restored. So it can be restored to where, right? Uh, Risk-free yield drop, which, you know, might happen a little bit that can try and move, but I mean, the valuations of stock need, needs to drop. And not just stock, I mean, even you look at junk spread, I mean, they, they have mm -hmm. barely, they have not moved. That's what everyone's been marveling about and wondering how this, like, it, like all of these things cannot be true, right. but it's been like that for a while. And and we just haven't seen, you know, one side. Um, I, I would, again, I, I would point to supply the and demand. I would, I would point to supply and demand. I think we spend far yeah. too much time and it's great for people like me because we, we, we get to go on TV and talk, but we spend far too much time trying to build stories around, you know, this may indicate this or that. And sometimes it's just as dumb as like more buyers and sellers. And right now there's more sellers and buyers in the treasury market and there's more buyers and sellers in the equity market because 
this is kind of the whole my green uh, argument, right? You have the 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 the, the passive, passive way, investing, all the money, yeah. all the money going into 401k funds, and it gets into mm-hmm. target date fund that buy regardless of price. It gets also funneled in in a very small number of stocks that make a bigger proportion of the index, which uh, and these stocks are extremely highly valued. That pulls up the valuation. I mean. Yeah, I can make an elaborate story about, you know, the Fed dot plot and, you know, the fact that they, you know, they're pricing a soft landing and, you know, uh, the higher yield reflect higher growth, but which benefits equities and all that stuff. But that would be me trying to fit narrative around the fact, sorry, fit, yeah. fit the facts around my narrative rather than, you know, just accepting the reality that for now there are buyers of stocks and there's sellers of bonds. Yep, that's such an honest and and seemingly accurate comment, Vincent, to make because I think sometimes we do overcomplicate things for ourselves. And um, for any of you who don't know Mike's thinking about this, Mike Green, we have many many shows on the platform where and and at our live events where he talks in depth about this, and he's worried about it. He's worried about that, you know, the consequences of that. Um, where do you see opportunity, Vincent? What do you like here? I mean, I'm I'm gonna. By the way, um, I've the, the previous guest has three, 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 three assets, right? Crypto, I dodged. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, stocks, oh, I answered. Yeah. So gold, gold I, um, I, I would put that. I mean, I think given the the move that we had in yields and real yields, and the fact that gold has held up pretty well. I mean, yeah, okay, off, you know, uh, you know, five percent. But uh, given that 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 huge move, I think it's extremely bullish for gold uh, to see uh, gold swallow. Uh, such a move in real yields. Um, so that that's certainly something that I like. Um, then I, I, I'll be boring. I mean, I again, um, hey, you can buy, you know, to your nose, get, you know, five and a half percent. Uh, if you buy the tips, you get, I mean, 3.3 percent fl- inflation adjusted. If you, if like me, you worry that, you know, inflation is not going to fall below 3 percent, uh, and then you may have a, a second spike, and there's a kind of geopolitical risk factor in the market that that's not being priced why why make things more complicated you know just mm-hmm. just, just, just just stay in cash um, you know wait it out you can the nice thing about the moving yields is that you can extend the duration like uh, before that i was just happy to roll in, in, in tbls now you can go up to two probably five years even mm-hmm. um and then uh something that i am often uh, being made fun of for being a broken clock whenever I go on real vision and I keep talking about the real yields in in Mexico and Brazil. They're still there. And by the way, the call's been right, so I'm not going to change it. I mean, look at the total return chart, the peso, the Brazilian real at any point over the past three years. I mean, <laughs> you make a lot of money when 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 the, when the deposit rate is about 10%. Uh, yeah, even if the, even the currency loses 1% a month, you still make out on the, on the total return basis. So, um, again, I think you have, uh, you know, probably the better opportunities are in emerging markets. I still like Latam, of course, you know, some of these trades are, are stretched, especially the Mexican peso. Maybe you can talk about that later. Um, uh, and then I, I would also look at even Europe. I mean, I know that's kind of a dirty word, but, um, it's if, shocking. If I, it's not just dirty, it's shocking. I mean, uh, you know, we're going into, if you want to listen to the bears on Europe, we're going into the winter. Can you get the extreme stars align that you did last year on that with energy pressures. Why do you like Europe? Is it a valuation call or is it yeah. you feel like the worst is priced in? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the, the valuation um, gap between Europe and the US hasn't been, um, it's never been bigger. Um, now, I, I understand the, the macro situation and, and yes, it's, it's, yeah, it's very bad if you, you know, if you, if you run an energy intensive business, uh, you know, I don't know if you make fertilizer or, uh, you know, some, some chemical compound that really needs a lot of, you know, gas, that's bad. But if you look at your European index, so uh, that's not what it's about. I mean, uh, the, the biggest way, you know, look at France. I mean, we, we destroy our industry in the past 40 years so greatly that there is none left. Uh, so, you know, how do a higher gas price affect, you know, the sales of LVMH? Well, we just talked about that again, coming full circle. This is why we're paying attention to their digital assets. We just heard that they went from 1% physical sales to increased it massively due to sort of really focusing on their digital strategy. A lot of luxury brands are doing that in Europe. Right. And another, another area that, you know, where, where I've been bullish in Europe and that's been the right call, it's Switzerland. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, so you've been Switzerland, talking about Switzerland a, for yeah. a long time. 
Switzerland has a great thing. It's got mountains and waters. And when you have mountains and water, you can build barrage and dams and then make electricity. And then you don't need to buy it from the Russians. Uh, and they're, um, you know, they're, they they have these massive, you know, trillion dollar plus in currency reserve that they can use to defend the, the Swiss franc. An index healthcare. that is heavily, exactly, healthcare and banks. Mm-hmm. I would actually argue that the European banks are a probably a completely forgotten story, right? I mean, this is like, I mean, yeah, well, we try, thought Credit Suisse was the walking they, debt, yes, right? We, try, that was like to the not, problem. Yeah, and what, UBS is fine. Like, they, they got it and, you know, try, but yeah, try to get not invited at a party to say, hey, I, I like European <laughs> banks. Like, <that's>, <laughs> <laughs> to be like, but can it's you been, please walk him outside? He's obviously delusional. <laughs> but after, just, after would, 15 years, yeah, they, they kind of solved a lot of these issues, you know, just, I mean, it's been relentless, just, you know, cutting, killing 15% yeah. of the staff, cutting the branches, raising capital, catching dividends, uh, that that kind of uh, value restoration project is, is more or less complete. Uh, you see higher rates in Europe. And I think contrary to the US, in the US, the problem with the banks when the rates are going up is people move their money, right? Uh, oh, they're going to take it away from the regional banks. Uh, on, on, on a cell phone. Right, <laughs> right. I mean, Europeans, you know, we, you know, we all, you know, I, I look at my mom, I mean, you know, Nothing will make a change. About I mean, I keep telling your mom, you know, like they they're ripping you off, like you 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 four percent, you know, like they they give you like ten basis points. People don't change their banks in Europe, so they actually get these higher net interest per margin in Europe. Interesting. I love we love your contrarian views, Vincent. It keeps us on our toes. I just want to make sure, and I'm giving us a couple extra minutes because we had Rao bomb in here. Um, just just fill us in on you're really looking at Mexico, right? Just give us mm-hmm. give us your peso overview before we wrap here because i know we do have a lot of people who who tune in and we don't talk about emerging markets enough so we love when you do right well so i've, I've been kind of a you know my two favorite currencies um well, three favorite currencies with the swiss franc uh, swiss franc mexican peso brazilian real uh for different reasons uh but the the peso is, is the one that worked the best of all uh we had a, about a depending when you look at it, but a 30% rally against the dollar. The best do a peso yen total return. I mean, this is this chart goes through the moon. And you know, these are two, you know, G2, maybe the, the third largest economy in the world. This is the ninth or something like that. Like you shouldn't see a 50% move between these, these currencies. So that the Mexicans made this term the super peso. You know, it seemed like the peso would just keep going up, 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 up. So I, I was actually visiting some clients uh, last week. Um, usually go to Mexico City. This time we went to Monterrey as well. Um, I thought Monterrey was was stunning. Monterrey is uh, the capital region of Nuevo León, which is the, the border region, historically kind of the wealthier industrial base. Uh, a lot of companies are quartered there. And I mean, I I lived in China in the, in the early 2000s. I, I was reminded by that, oh. you know, you, you go out and you see cranes everywhere and people are running and the hotels are full and, you know, the, the airport is busting with people. Um, so there, there is the there is a an investment boom in Mexico and specifically in that region of New Orleans. Um, and I think that's one of the drivers of that super peso. That uh, mm-hmm. and then, of course, it's insanely high real yields, uh, which, you know, that the, the Bank of Mexico in the same as the same as Central Bank of Brazil. A lot of the emerging central bankers were smarter. Like, you know, when we were telling all these transitory insanity and, and Lagarde was talking about that the inflation hump that's gonna yeah. whatever. Like, I mean, these guys were had already jacked up rate to 10 percent because well, they know what they've got a lot like. of experience fighting. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's, re- it's so a recent now, fight for them. Yes. It's a recent yes. fight. So now you see inflation falling down, you get that like, really is like six, seven percent. Uh, so this was a driver of the super peso. Now, of course, the move has been so extreme. I mean, if you look on a sound deviation base, it's probably a, almost a forced sound deviation move. Uh, so you're like, okay, surely there's going to be a reversal, uh, especially if, as I worry, we see a risk off mood. Because, uh, you know, the, the, the peso is still kind of a carry trade, right? So if, if yeah. suddenly the Japanese need to send their money back because the Bank of Japan is, is easing uh, yield of control policies, or you see treasury yields spike up, or you just see risk aversion pick up, that that was one of the reasons why I was thinking that the super peso might be a victim. But again, I don't think this is something that will be. We're not going to have a tequila crisis. We're not going to see. Um, so, of course, we went to almost 16 to the dollar, which, you know, is kind of insane. Mm-hmm. You know, could we go to, to 20? Surely. Um, could we go to 25? I, I don't think so. Uh, because part, the fundamental story is, is there. Like, this is not a, uh, yes, we, we are trying to um, reshore 
I was going to say, it's no longer just commodity. You've got yes. layered on that now, the regionalization pull, which even if it waxes and wanes is is real, you know, just given the disruptions, political, and, and, and political, just climate wise, like people want their stuff closer. Right. You know, so. and, and I think that story, I think, ties in with 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 my broader kind of great reset, high inflation, higher growth, higher rates story. When and I got that when I was looking at, 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 at Monterey and I'm thinking, mm. oh, my God, like, you know, Monterey, the entire Nuevo, I mean, the entire Mexican economy is a small Chinese province. Mm -hmm. You know, it's probably like a, a city, you know, a, a Chinese city, like a Shenzhen. I, I don't have the exact number, but yeah. And we were trying to cram, you know, uh, this huge beast of, you know, factories. And, so, and, 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 and I mean, yes, the way on it, it's beautiful. OK, but like the infrastructure is nowhere where China had. I mean, mm -hmm. and then and, and then, you know, China has these big rivers so you, you can develop the, the hinterland if the coastal areas get overblown and you have this amazing infrastructure and you have this massively, you know, growing educated population. And Mexico, I mean, Mexico is great. I mean, the demographics look good, the, the population is educated, but you also have to have like a security guard in front of, in front of every single building, yeah. uh, which is kind of an added cost and you don't have the same level of infrastructure yes some parts of northern mexico are naturally integrated with texas but you know you can't move stuff from right. from Chiapas so it's all gonna or... have to be spent exactly be spent. exactly yeah if we really are serious about this whole thing of like de-risking and, and moving away from china we are we're going to have a cram a, a huge beast into a tiny hole and that will create a lot of friction and that friction will mean high interest rates it will mm. mean high inflation and it will mean higher for longer well, I love this conversation, um, and I wanted to make sure, um, Leon, that we don't we just add on, we don't take away, right? So we still had our great macro conversation, and short term and long term, which is what I love. So short term trading, but also these long term um, developments that we really need to keep an eye on. So we love that we're able to do both with you when you're here, Vincent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right, guys, that wraps us for today. We will be doing Festival of Learning drum roll tomorrow, realvision.com forward slash festival 23 to join us for that. Um, otherwise, uh, we will see you same time, same place. We'll be live all day. Take care and good luck out there, everybody. Humans will have more digital things and digital value and digital things in their life tomorrow than they, than they do today. This really is a revolution. I'm really excited to announce our partnership with Ledger to help educate you in your digital asset journey. Like self-custody is freedom. If not self-custody, why crypto? So join us for the Festival of Learning Digital Asset Edition with Real Vision and Ledger. Some of the greatest names in the industry will be there and all the topics that really matter. So click on the link below and join us. It's free to join. Everybody's going to be there. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Today's Real Vision Daily Briefing is sponsored by CraneShares. Learn about their KCCA ETF at craneshares.com forward slash KCCA forward slash Real Vision.